Hello everyone, I am Elena Pasoli, director of the Bologna Children's Book Fair. It is with great pleasure that I open this first international forum on children's literary translation, which is organized in the framework of Aldous Up, the European network of book fairs co-founded by Creative Europe Programme. I said first forum because, of course, we will have a second one next year in person eventually. Translators have always been at the heart of the Bologna Children's Book Fair because they are, in fact, the heart of the transmission of children's literature in the world. Moreover, in their role of profound knowledge of the literary landscape of the languages they translate, children's book translators play a very important role in scouting new authors and new books besides the key role for the translation. The Bologna Book Fair has always worked to help this exceptional category of professionals be recognized for all the richness of their work in every sense. I am proud to say that in addition to the many activities of our Translator Center and in Altre Parole Prize, Every year, Bologna Fiere offers the translators of books that win the Premio Strega Ragazzi e Ragazze, when the winning book is a book in translation, of course, a prize equal to that of the author, precisely to underline the importance of their role in the success of a book. I would like to thank all our speakers for accepting our invitation and Professor Terinoni as first for bringing us his inspirational contribution. And a big, big thank you to all the translators associations that have always been at our side in the conception and implementation of all our activities. And I would like to express my special thank you to Simona Mambrini for the great work in designing and preparing this conference together with the Anna Belluti of the BCBF team. And of course, thank you to all of you who follow us from home and whom I hope to welcome next year in Bologna from March 21st to 24th. Simona, your turn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for hosting this important event. And hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Simona Mambrini, a literary translator and a consultant for the Bologna Children's Book Fair. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Virtual Translator Center of the 58th edition of the Bologna Children's Book Fair. I am also thrilled to chair this very special event with a focus on the status and working conditions of literary translators of children's books in Europe, down the rabbit hole working and surviving as a translator of children's books. In this panel, we will we'll try to take stock of the current professional situation of translators of children's books in Europe er, and elsewhere, the rates, royalties, contracts, uh, negotiating power and visibility. Our panelists from several European translators associations and unions will discuss good and bad practices in different countries and what can be done to improve the situation and hopefully help foster a change for the better. It ain't easy to hang out uh, your shingle and earn your bread as a literary translator, to quote from a, a Zoom event that took place just last night and featured Daniel Han, who is also with us today. Translation is a challenging, complex and highly creative activity and since literature, and especially children's literature, is so wonderfully rich in nuances, challenges, and complexities, translating it is, consequently, such an arduous task. Translators are indeed to be granted greater cultural recognition and subsequent remuneration within the publishing industry, but also in a wider frame of cultural policies. Sure enough, although it's true that literary translators are passionate people, Translation is a profession, not a labor of love. But 
Before getting to the heart of the matter, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, award-winning translator, Joycean scholar and professor of English literature at the University for Foreigners in Perugia, Enrico Terrinoni, who has kindly agreed to set the ball rolling with a keynote speech entitled, Who Owns Our Words? Translation as the stuff we are made on. Enrico, over to you. Thank you, Simona. Thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm going to just share my, my screen for a couple of quotes that I want to... Uh, okay. In order to share, to share my, sc my screen, I think they have to deactivate the, the screen that yeah. you're saying. Okay. okay. So, okay. Just one second. I hope you can now see my screen. Are. Yes. And it's going to go full screen now. So the title of my paper is Who Owns Our Words? Translation as the stuff we are made on. Um, I'm very glad to be here today with you today to kick off this uh, very important meeting, although my topic is a bit, uh, bit off the subject, because uh, I'm going to talk very generally about my uh, ideas uh, about translation. And I'd like to start by uh, beginning in medias res, introducing the, the core argument of my talk, which is the basic equation that translation means living. We are all translating beings. I think that uh, we in translation studies should uh, really come to terms with this fundamental existential truth so as to understand also that translation is not a Cinderella art, as they say. Translation is what we are. And by the way, Cinderella was the main protagonist of the mentioned tale. So let's accept that we are all Cinderellas in our own personal ways. Now, I dare say that also the father of the English language, uh, William Shakespeare, knew that translation had to do with life, with what we are. This is uh, what we read and hear in As You Like It. I kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, thy liberty into bondage. It is what uh, Clown uh, Touchstone says to William, what's in the name, uh, thinking that William is in love with his own Audrey. To translate here leads to death, and it does not seem to be a linguistic affair at all. Or rather, it might, if we take that to be the imposition of silence upon words. In this way, it is about language, the language of the dead being silence after all. Translation here also means deprivation. But what Shakespeare must have had in mind in using the verb to translate was something like a change of state, an alteration of the manner in which we exist. If this is so, couldn't we say that to live is to constantly translate ourselves? After all, what we do from the very day we are born until the final moment we breathe our last is we change ourselves. We become the others that we do know not of, in the words of Prince Hamlet. Another master of the English language, though an Irishman, James Joyce, uh, also uses the cheap excuse of a permanent existential self-translation to justify the even cheaper intention of his avatar, Stephen Dedalus, to not pay back a pound that he has borrowed five months before. This is what we read in one of, the, of his semi-Hamletic monologues in, in Ulysses. Wait, five months, molecules all change. I am other I now, other I got pound. In another passage of the same episode, the same frustrated young man gives his listener the following piece of wisdom in an attempt to, to demonstrate that we really are the others. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, wid widows, brothers in love, but always meeting ourselves. In living, we continuously change ourselves. We become the others. And translation is change, for it turns a text into another. Ergo, translation equals living, in my view. In the Renaissance, translation was everything. Queen Elizabeth spoke fluent Italian, as did many others at court. And a fine intellectual of the time, John Florio, an Italianate Englishman who some suspect of being Shakespeare and who translated Montaigne from, from French into English, but also Boccaccio from the Italian, 
suggested that according to his friend, Giordano Bruno, from translation, all signs has its offspring. Actually, in doing so, Florio was quoting Samuel, Samuel Daniel, who in turn was quoting Bruno, the Italian philo philosopher who imagined the infinity of the universe and who was consequently burned at stake by the Church of Rome in 1600. Here, science means knowledge, and translation means conversion. To translate is, in Florio's vision, to make knowledge accessible to others. It means really to reach out to the others. For knowledge exists solely when it is made common, when it is communicated. By the same token, bo books exist only when read. And in the words of John Donne, human beings become what they are only when they stop being islands and realize that they are part of the continent. This is the quotation from Meditation 17, very famous. But if translation, which is founded on interpretation, is fundamentally the way we live, this is because we cannot help interpreting the signs around us. From the moment we wake up in the morning, our living is a continuous interpretation. Try and spend a few moments now avoiding interpreting what surrounds you, and you'll find out that this is not possible. However, translation as interpretation is not an easy equation at all. In fact, in buying a book in translation, who would not be slightly disappointed if the bookshop assistant bluntly told us, good choice, this is a very good type of interpretation of the original. When we buy a translated book, what we want is the real thing, but the real thing only lives in a different language. Why are we so often oblivious of that? Why would it be so disturbing to hear that the thing we are purchasing is an interpretation rather than the book we wanted to read? Is translation really almost the same thing as the original, as Umberto Eco also argued? Or is it not the case that a translated text may be something different and its interpreter be a sort of seer, a diviner of science, a prophet? In an obscure, obscurely prophetic book included in the Bible, the book of Daniel, we read of the secret wisdom hidden in the act of interpreting signs. Here's the story. During the generous banquet offered by King Belshazzar, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand appear and they begin to write something on the, pl on the plaster of the wall in the royal palace. This is what we read in 5.5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, very haunting. The message delivered on the wall is cryptic, like that of certain writers. It is a prophecy, a warning, but it must, first of all, be interpreted. Here is the context which, which can help one interpret it. The king of Babylon had invited many important guests to the feast. They are drinking and eating from the gold and silver cups taken from the temple in Jerusalem. The appearance of the fingers of one hand beginning to write on the wall upsets everyone. The king, in evident difficulty, asks enchanters, astrologers, and diviners for help, promising gifts and great honors to those who will be able to interpret those signs. Unfortunately, nobody can make sense of them. It is at this point that the king's mother calls for Daniel, who had already been appointed head of the sages by the grandfather of the king. Daniel says that pride was the cause of the fall of the previous king, and it is a risk that the new king is also running. The current king is guilty of not having honored God, preferring fake gods made of wood and stone. The inscription on the wall reads, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Upharsin. How to interpret those words, which do not seem to belong to any known language? And here is Daniel's interpretation, or rather his translation, which will make those words common, communicating their meanings to the others in the room. 
The first word repeated twice indicates that according to God's will, the days of the reign of the king are numbered. The second signals that the king is considered lacking. The third word means that the kingdom will pass from the hands of the Babylonians to those of the Medes and the Persians. Now, the prophecy has hardly, hardly has the time to be uttered that the two people are already attacking Babylon and the king will soon be murdered. It is an anomalous prophecy which occurs immediately after having been pronounced and whose truthfulness cannot be questioned because it has immediate effects. It functions very much as a declaration of war. Of course, we can hypothesize that Daniel was perhaps in league with the Medes and the Persians and that he was therefore the magical and occult instigator of the secret hand. Such a solution makes for a horror story. How many horror films have prophecies that materialize all too quick after being pronounced? It is part of the game. Daniel's interpretation of the prophecy has a factual urgency. It is reminiscent of the warnings of scientists nowadays who tell us about climate change. We do perceive the consequences of those inauspicious changes. We do, we do not perceive the consequences of those changes in everyday life. We don't care. We like to imagine that the most harmful effects will only materialize in the future, but they are just around the corner. The story told in the book of Daniel is also a good metaphor for the implications of the act of reading and translating. When we read a text, our way of decoding its secrets has an obvious and immediate impact on the interpretive choices that will guide the continuation of our work. Understanding is always an intermediate step in a broader process, which in hindsight must be identified once again with the delayed framework of existence, which is a journey rather than a destination. And this also applies to translation, which is not in more then a very close way of reading texts, selecting contents and forms and reproducing them so that another journey, a journey done by others may begin. Daniel is the translator of the occult hand, but he is also the one who decrees its meaning, the one who points the way. I said that we cannot avoid interpreting the forest of signs around us. And I also suggested that interpreting and therefore translating means living, just like living, and just like living, it requires codes. It is through the codes which help us live that we learn from our mistakes. Mistakes are really nothing more than misunderstandings caused by our incapability to perceive all which surrounds us. To make mistakes is to err, which means at the same time, to go wrong and to go astray, to leave one spot or line of the direction. But to err is our fate, since Adam and Eve, it was God himself who condemned the first man to err, E-R-R, -R, when he had to abandon Eden. And one wonders who made the first error, God or Adam. Translations, just like life, can be full of mistakes. But mistakes can become the portals of discovery. The letters that the king and his puzzled guests read on the wall cannot be understood. They can only be interpreted. And interpreters are diviners of signs. But here's another version of the story, another option. The meaning of those words which appear on the wall could even be totally arbitrary. But we only have Daniel to trust and the materialization of the prophecy somehow corroborates his authority. In other words, that language can be totally made up. It can be an invented language, but isn't this the very origin of languages? Invention, creation. In the beginning was the word we read, we read in the Gospel of John, but before the word and the world was the void. Even some, some cosmologists nowadays would agree with John the Evangelist. Staying with theologies, 
that thing that before the fact that before the beginning was the void is also a Kabbalistic belief. And curiously, also some mystics of the Eastern Christianity would hold that view. Only in what cases the void which precedes the word is God. So basically, God is the void and also the essence capable of filling it. Can we say then that this God is his own opposite? Now, bear with me for a second. I'll go back to translation in a while, but I need to stay with this because it's a, I think it's a, a metaphor that could help us understand a few things about what translation is. In the beginning was the word. This is John, the beginning of the Gospel of John. Fine. Let's agree that this word was invented. And to invent is a close relative of the Latin verb invenio, meaning both to discover and to recover. To some extent, discovering the meaning, the meaning of words is also to recover them from some forgotten past, to recover them from silence. Could it be that this is so because, of, because our words, after all, are not ours at all? We simply use them and then they change hands. With the words, we fill the void, or rather the silence. And when those words are interpreted, how humanity is fulfilled, for to exist is to interpret. But to interpret can help us reveal, as in the case of Daniel, but it can also help us reveal, to veil again. As in, as in the alternative option, according to which Daniel is a plotter and not a seer. Friedrich Nietzsche, for instance, revealed and veiled again that the prison house of our life is a linguistic one. Its prison bars are not places where you can order a, a drink. But since you can take the man out, the, out of the bar, but you cannot take the bar out of the man, it is only through language that we can avoid being barred from life, so to speak. It is through translation that we escape our linguistic jail, leaving at the same time our mother tongue and the linguistic land of our fathers. When we come to the world, we come to the world. We manifest ourselves with our body and in the form of noises, meaningless noises and yet noises that can be interpreted. But the question is, can they be translated? James Joyce has many apparently untranslatable sentences, or rather sentences that are translatable only in terms of meaning, which leaves out not only the original sound or noise, for this is what happens to all translations, but also the fact that their meaning is conveyed through their sound. I'm not talking of Finnegan's Wake, a children's book I had, to, I had the burden and the nightmare to translate into Italian with my friend and colleague Fabio Pedone. I'm talking of Joyce's easy book, Dubliners. In one of the, the best stories in it, called A Painful Case, we read, we are our own, we are our own. Four syllables, a circularity of sounds, and an economy of meaning and music, which cannot be translated, at least into Italian. It is a semantic, pragmatic quickness, which spells out an obsession with ownership, which characterizes our human being, or rather, our, our being human beings. This obsession with property cannot be applied to language, to language used as a means to communicate. I mean, language as a tool to make knowledge common. In other words, it cannot be applied to translation. Not even the writers who are more keen to control the various stages of the composition of their works could ever state that they have control also over the text's interpretations. Actually, the great writers are those whose works can be interpreted in infinite ways. Their open works give readers freedom of interpretation. After all, who are we to assert that we know all the effects our words will have on another person? 
we are in general often inclined to believe or rather to feel that we own our words, that the words we say are our. And we normally do not pay too much attention to the very fact that any concept of property cannot be too easily applied to immaterial domains, such as sound, thought, intentions, aspirations. The words that we use might well be our own property, but this proprietorship lasts only a very fleeting moment, that of their physical production. Once heard or read, and then interpreted, words belong to other people who hear or read them. In fact, words belong to users as much as to producers. And this is so because they never reach the other in the same shape or form as the one they had before. In the transit between dialoguing subjects, words change, also because their meanings change. Their intentions are subject to modifications connected with the ineluctability of interpretation, that is, of the process of unveiling and reveiling, which makes us add new significance to old words, rendering them all anew all the time. Mass goers at the end of a reading during the Mass from the sacred texts often hear the preacher suggest that they just heard the word of God. And yet, how can such words belong to an invisible entity when they are actually produced by a visible one? And if those words were in fact only dictated by an immortal entity, the ones we hear have been subject to an ongoing process of translation. But one may suggest that God was the greatest of translators for he managed to give us new words which in the linguistic transit have not changed at all. What though if those words once did belong to God, but now that they are pronounced by others and heard by others in turn are in fact the property of somebody else. In passing from one person to another, a word always gets translated, if only in the sense of mutating changing shape, sound, and meaning. It has been argued that writing a poem means translating from an absent original. This was said by Gabriele Frasca, the Italian translator of Becht. So the poem is a translation from an absent original. In this case, to, trans to translate really means to invent. But don't we invent our lives day by day? putting together thoughts, interpretation, wishes, desires, and instincts in an endless, erring journey. To live and to translate ourselves are not journeys to the past, but steps towards the future. Accordingly, the type of knowledge human beings feed themselves on is not based on originals, but on their shadows, their projections, their translations, their changed versions. Take humor, for example. Humor hardly ever translates into a different culture and linguistic system. If it does not undergo some sort of radical change. I was personally very amused recently by a joke I read on an Irish paper, which I've been trying to translate into Italian for the past few months without any luck. This is the joke. Two cannibals are eating a clown. And one says to the other, does this taste funny to you? The problem here is, of course, the meaning of the idiom to taste funny and its connection with the clown's flesh. However, what I find personally very, very funny is not the second part of the joke, but the first one. The very idea that two cannibals might be eating a clown is funny to me. And the fun continues with the actual joke when the actual joke is spelled out. In Italian, I can, trans can easily translate the first part, and it's funny, but the linguistic impossibility of translating the second part spoils the whole joke. The only way to keep the fun is to change the second part, and I tried it in so many ways. Some work better than others, but the problem remains. To translate this joke, I have to change it. 
This is what happens with what has been called intralingual translation, the reformulation of the same concept within one linguistic system. In other words, to say things in other words. Things, in fact, change much more when they are relocated in different languages. But since the same language might be inhabited by different cultures, any same meaning actually changes accordingly, following different cultural coordinates, until it finally becomes something totally different and new in its reformulations. Target conditions always change. And in turn, they change the thing translated. For translation changes everything. And yet, Umberto Eco's intuition is a good one when he said that to translate is to do almost the same thing. Eco also reminds us that the term translatio first appeared in the sense of change, even of address, transport, and metaphor, which would explain why centers later, another clown, Touchstone, spoke to William as he did. Translation being change, in order to describe it as almost the same thing, we have to intend that precious particle almost in all its universality. In Ulysses, when Liber Bloom happens to have a reverie on a strange dream he had the night before, featuring among, among other things, a street of harlots, he thinks, I am almost in it. By turning that particle into a verb, Joyce was able to demonstrate that words have no fixed functions, and also that knowledge can never be fully grasped. It can only be almost. That is, one can seize its sh shadow as if a material object or an immaterial one, such as a dream, can really cast its own projections even in the absence of light. One needs light to project shadows. But light is, so to speak, just an instrument. It is an entity in use. We don't grasp it but we grasp many other things thanks to it. As for the things themselves, one will never get hold of them, but one can pretty well always snatch an image of them. It is quite reasonable, I think, to consider translating as doing almost the same thing, provided that we take into account the boundless semantic value of the particle almost which makes our knowledge of the world always provisional, and I would say shadowy. And shadowy is also the mortal condition, the condition of mankind. We all belong to a common dimension whose borders are not too visible because they depend, because we depend on each other. This ancient philosophical theme is thus reformulated in an almost optimistic way. If the shadow signifies the human condition and also the impossibility of human knowledge to directly grasp the truth and the light of things, that is the ideas, the platonic forms, we might still sense them by making the right connections to perceive them. In other words, we can reconnect images in order to make sense of the universe and understand that it really is an organic whole where everything is connected to everything else. But to translate, which is to make connections, is also, of course, an attempt at extracting. Only what translators dig out is the very material which will shape their new versions of old books. Translation is the evolution of an old text. We naturally and culturally resist this notion, perhaps because we are afraid of the possibility that to resist might mean to re-exist. Resistance as re-existence is a stance that probably captures the very essence of translation. A text which born out of a pretext becomes the pretext for a new text, for a post-text. So you can see it's hybridity its sense of foreignness, which nothing will ever quench. 
a translation is born in and out of otherness. It lives in strangeness. It, sta it stays external, if not eternal, though sharing many a border with its inspiring text. Translators are always aware of the precious silence they are called upon to fill. To fill it with new sounds and noises is their job in a never ending infinite exchange, an endless negotiation. To translate means to silently understand that we are, we are the condition for the existence of the others. Our words are already the post text. The reason why we communicate at all is because we secretly long to be the others we are not yet. We silently crave to be the other who is unknown to us. We in fact are sometimes afraid of what we are not because at times the enemy is in us. But the enemy might not be an enemy after all for like God, we are our own opposite. In order to live, we need to accept and integrate the precious foreignness, which makes us what we are, human relational beings. Translation, translation in fact, also means to accept and to integrate. It means replacing, replacing silences with sounds, but it is also an attempt to state that nobody owns words. Nobody is the proprietor even of one's own words as those very words once uttered are no more ours. How can we possess words without casting upon them a malevolent spell? In fact, in the attempt to make a foreign text our own in translation, we happen to lose it. For we will deliver not what was, but what will be. Translation is a looking glass reflecting not the past, but the future, which we can only imagine. And by doing so, just as we proceed living our lives, we relocate a text in some future space time so that it can achieve some new life and evolve. Translation then is a process, but it is also an aim and it is always in progress. The aim, its end, is to say that the game is not over yet. And when we have an end in mind, our mind does not end. It might very well end up creating the possibility for us to do the impossible. And to translate is to do the impossible, to rewrite the same story afresh by simply making it different. Is this not the way life works too? English poet William Blake in his Proverbs, Proverbs Proverbs of, of hell, which few readers read nowadays, said that everything possible to be believed is an image of the truth. We are again talking about reflections, about the shadows of the truth, those that are impossibly grasped. But we should also always be reminded that Alice in her wonderland knew how to think about six impossible things before breakfast. This is because the impossible is not one what cannot be obtained, but what has not been obtained yet. And translation can help reach that, even before traversing the looking glass. Translation is a projection on our tomorrows. It is the continuation of a previous life. It turns a dead text into a nosferatu, an undead one. It is, in the words of Melville, a dead letter, which can come to life when it actually reaches its addressee, or even some other person who happens by chance to open it and read it. Through translation, the past turns into the future in different shapes. With Ulysses, Joyce made Homer's Odyssey different. And Pierre Menard, in Jorge Luis Borges' famous short story about the rewriting of Don Quixote achieved as much or even more. In fact, like God before, Menar re rewrote the Quixote by not changing a single word of it. His was a new Quixote, not the same one written by Cervantes. And yet 
it contained the same words in the same order, the same sentences, the same episodes. It was the very same thing, but a different one at the same time. Different because it would be read with different eyes. A 20th century reader could not in any way interpret the adventures of the sad knight in the same way a 17th century one would have done. With translation, everything changes, and yet everything stays almost the same at the same time. But time is never the same. Time never stops. And with it, the space around us, which changes continuously. The new mental space is shaped by a work in translation or by our life in translation are never final goals. They are always intermediate stages. And therefore, they are also new starting points for novel interpretations of that novel we call life. As a matter, as a matter of fact, many world novels are nowadays read in translation. We even re read the foundational texts of our cultures, almost always in translation, like the scriptures of the Hebrew and the Christian traditions, for example, Quran. This very fact is never stressed enough. Readers take it for granted most of the time that what they are reading, when reading a sacred text, for instance, is uh, not the same thing as the original. They, they think that it is the same. And at the same time, they are not easily persuaded into believing that translation is always interpretation, as I said. We simply don't want to know that what we are reading is indeed something written not by the author, but by someone else. With religious works, this is even more dangerous. A tweet circulated recently in the form of a short, concise letter to a white supremacist, which read, Dear supremacist, do you realize that the son of God you worship was a dark-skinned Jew who spoke Aramaic? If we always find relief in the consoling thought that a translation is not an interpretation of a previous text, this is also because interpreting a book is supposed to be the job of the critics, those who write introductions or book reviews. Translators shouldn't interpret text, they should just translate. And yet, it is never that simple, for any act of reading is a translation. Any act of reading is an interpretation and also a mental mnemonic rewriting. The situation becomes even more complex when we are dealing with open texts like Hamlet, for instance. For there are texts that are more open than others, though the degrees of openness can always be debated. Interpretation like light can hit on anything. As Leonard Cohen wrote, there is a crack, a crack in everything, and that's where the light gets in, which might point to the fact that illumination does not require total openness. Light can, like in Caravaggio's paintings, just hit on some meaningful detail in the dark shadow, shadow of it all. And those small details might prove much more revealing than the work in its totality. The light that creeps in dark pictures works very much like rhymes in poetry. The rhyme in Shane McGowan's lines, seeing the carnival in Rome, had the women, I had the booze. All I can remember now is little kids without no shoes, creates unexpected connections that cannot be fully grasped because others never fully know what they are doing when composing. They don't own their words, for those words belong to us. And translating makes for the new life. Translation can help us escape our prison house of language, a labyrinth we can still flee linguistically and culturally. This is why translators, as well as human beings, will, all, will, will always be foreigners. They will not belong. They will not be their own. For as James Joyce wrote in Finnegan's Wake, it was when you and they were we that true 
ne the never, en never ending acts of interpretation, we become the others. To conclude, let me quote again from uh, Big Umberto, who quite rightfully argued that translation is a species of the genus interpretation. A statement interesting in many regards. Firstly, because it uses a properly scientific terminology rather than a linguistic or literary one. The fact that one can think of translation in terms of a species seems to suggest that it might actually behave like living species and therefore be subject to evolution, but also to extinction. To call interpretation a genus is even more revealing. Interpretation is in fact in our genes. It is almost a genetic affair. We can no doubt consider interpretation a universal in the functioning of the human mind. Human beings are translating beings insofar as they are naturally inclined to decipher one another. One might be tempted to conclude that interpretation is what distinguishes living species from non-living ones. But recent discoveries in the field of artificial intelligence and robotics would appear to contradict such an equation. Robots and computers can indeed interpret. More than the task of processing data, their reason for living is interpreting. And to do so, they have to make connections, which leads us to surely enlarge our conception of what life can be. If life is not interpretation, certainly interpretation is a species of the genus life. In life, we first interpret, then translate. We first experience stimuli, and then translate them into images, sensations, thoughts, words, actions, and so on. This means living. It is our destiny. And if you don't mind me saying this, it is a nice destiny after all. Thank you. Okay, I shall be on screen now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Enrico, for Thank you very much for your, I have to take a deep breath because uh, it was a powerful and thought provoking speech, well, yours, and I, th I think that just kind of set the stage for our discussion. And uh, I know you're, you're waiting now for your Joycean symposium, but just let me thank you again. And, and just saying that uh, we will switch from translation as meaning living from making a living in translation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for it's... being with us. Thank you, bye-bye. And maybe if you, for the attendees uh, are invited to, if they have questions, to wait until the end of, of the plenary session to put them in the Q&A, uh, in the chat box. Uh, so, uh, now let's get down to the nitty gritty and get started. Uh, but before that, a uh, few practicalities. Um, as we are using webinar functions, attendees won't be able to interact directly. However, I strongly recommend to keep your audio mute and the web, uh, <clears throat> webcam off just in case. Uh, each panelist will speak in turn. And at the end of the roundtable conference, there will be a Q&A session. Of course, participants are welcome to post their questions or comments in the chat box and at any time during the webinar. And our panelists will answer at the end of the plenary session. So we have a very rich panel and I'll briefly introduce each one of, of uh, our panelists in order or appearance. Uh, for the full bios, please go to the main page of the event. So I warmly welcome Lara Holbly Markovic, a literary translator from English and German to Croatian and Secretary General of CATEL, European Council of Literary Translators Associations. Kevin Quirk, who translates from Norwegian into English and is currently the president 
of the International Federation of Translators Associations. Uh, Marta Moros Serret, a children's book translator from English and Japanese into Spanish and Catalan, former president of the Croatian Literary Translators Association and current members of the FIT Council. Uh, Lena Janssen, also a children's and young adult book translator from English into Swedish from the board of the, of the Swedish Writers' Union Translators' Section. Daniel Hahn, a writer, editor, and award-winning translator, recently uh, appointed officer of the Order of the British Empire in the 2020 Birthday Honours for Services to Literature, and is a well-known advocate for the translation community. Valérie Le Punec, who translates children's book from English to French and is treasurer of uh, ATLF, the French Literary Translators Association, and secretary of CERTEL. Alexandra Rack, who's also, who also translates children's and young adult book from English to German, and she's from the Association of German Literary Translators. Eva Valvo, literary translator from Danish and Norwegian into Italian and board member of STRADE, the Union of Italian Literary Translators, and Francesca Novaira, translators of children's book from English and French into Italian, and member of uh, Associ the Association of Italian Translators and Interpreters and uh, on member of the Seattle board. I'd like to thank you all for agreeing to participate in this panel discussion and a special thank to Francesca Novaira and Eva Valvo for their help in coordinating the organization of this panel. And now, without further ado, it is with great pleasure that I hand over to our first speaker, Lena holbin Makovic, Secretary General of CERTEL. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very much needed conference. Um, allow me first to express in my name and the name of Teatel <clears throat> our great joy in this cooperation with the Bologna Children's Book Fair, hoping that it is also the beginning of a beautiful friendship. The European Council of Literary Translators Associations, or Teatel for short, is the umbrella organization of literary translators associations in Europe with 34 members from 29 countries and counting. A very important part of Teatel's activities are the working groups whose members devote their time to the exploration and analysis of five major fields, authors' rights, best practices, news and visibility, training and education, and last but definitely not least, working conditions. Having in mind that some countries have more than one association, our rough estimate is that we represent around 10,000 literary translators from a large majority of European languages, many of whom not only translate for children and the young, but have for years been present in person or in book at this very fair. The specific problems encountered and then mentioned by translators for children and the young at our various meetings, and the hope that we would already last year be able to speak about that in Bologna, led us, Francesca Novaira, our new board member from IIT, Eva Valvo from Strade, and also part of our news and visibility group, and myself, to conduct a very informal survey among our members' associ association's members who translate such literature in order to find the most interesting subjects we could later analyze in depth within Teatl. At the same time, one of Teatl's five working groups I've already mentioned, the group dedicated to the working conditions of literary translators, coordinated by Claudia Steinitz from the German VDU, has been conducting a general survey led by Mikel Caval Guaro from the Association of Catalan Writers and member of the Teatl Executive Board. This survey was distributed among our members' associations members, and there we have also included the question specifically aimed at translators for children and the young about discrepancies in remuneration. In the informal survey, we asked our delegates to forward it to five or six colleagues who are active translators for children and the young. 
they were asked several questions about the market and about their working conditions and visibility. We emphasized that the answers can be written in as much detail as the participant would like, and that we are mostly interested in their view of the matters, the standpoint of someone who is a pr practitioner in the field. We have received some 60 answers from 19 countries. To the question included in our formal survey on general working conditions, we received in total almost 3,700 answers from translators for children and the young from 30 countries. Analyzing the informal survey, one can conclude that mostly the general situation is very similar in all of these countries. The markets seem to be thriving in all segments from cardboard books targeting babies to literature for young adults. The productions are big and ranging from mass market entertainment to high quality art, albeit prevalently from the English speaking part of the world. All translators claim to be enjoying the work they do, although also agreeing that translating for children often poses a greater challenge than translating for grown-ups. However, what is also mentioned too often to be considered subjective is the fact that translating literature for children and the young is regularly perceived as easy, less prestigious, and not worthy of serious attention. There seems to be a deep-rooted belief among publishers and critics that it requires less skill and less knowledge. Well, I'd like to see them translate Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, for instance. Statements from all countries also report that publishers do not look for professional literary translators, but stick to so-called in-house translations. My question is, who is in the house? Does this mean that books get translated by editors, by marketing staff, by a program or other, or worse? But most worryingly, publishers try not to, or plainly refuse, to write up contracts or even to pay fees, and especially royalties. Comparing these statements to the question from our formal survey, whether they sometimes, always, or never get lower rates for translating literature for children and the young, we can see that about half of the translators who do translate children's literature always or sometimes get paid less than when translating books for grown-ups. As translators from countries that have a standardized contract seem to fare better, this also emphasizes the need to work on recommended or standardized contracts in countries that don't. Since there are great discrepancies, not only among countries and or languages, but also among translators from the same association, when it comes to questions of remuneration, one might argue that some of these discrepancies depend on the individual negotiating skills, professional standing, and legal backup these translators have. It would therefore be more helpful to turn our attention to a more objective way of gauging the general reception and prestige translating literature for children and the young offers. And that is the existence or rather non-existence of awards and honors. The International Book on Boards, uh, uh, Board on Books for Young People or IBBY has sections and branches in 33 European countries. Almost all of them add their recommendations to the well-known IBBY honor list and some even have domestic ceremonies honoring or awarding best writers, illustrators, and translators. However, apart from this very laudable world organization dedicated to the promotion of literacy, one of the 20, uh, out of the 29 countries we interviewed, 19 have no national award for the translation of children's literature whatsoever, and three report having a prize for translating literature in general, from which children's literature is not excluded, 
But looking at the list of laureates, it is not included either. As one can see, only a quarter of countries consider translations of literature for children and the young worthy of a prize, which also confirms our findings that children's literature is considered less important than grown-up literature. These remaining seven countries who do have a prize are the Basque country, with the Vittoria Gasteis Award in two categories, children and young adults, consisting of a diploma and 9,000 euro. Croatia, with the association's Josip Tabak Prize for best translation for children and the young in a given year, consisting of a diploma and about 300 euro. Germany, the old and well-established Deutsche Jugend Literaturpreis with two recent new categories for new talents and overall achievement awards. Iceland with the Reykjavik Children's Book Award for translation and a couple of other honors. Italy with the recently established Strega Prize for boys and girls, where author and translator get an equal amount of money. And Norway with the Bastian Prize awarded by the Norwegian Association and a Ministry of Culture Translation Award. As far as I could make out, all of these words also include a monetary element. The seventh country on the list is Slovenia, where an award has just been established by the board of the Slovenian Literary Translators Association. It will be awarded from next year onward, divided into four categories, which will rotate annually. Children, young adults, picture book, graphic novel. Bravo Slovenia, douze points. Since the information gathered in surveys and interviews with members has shown that there is a great need for further investigation, activism, and lobbying in the field of literary translation for children and the young, it is obvious that Seattle will have its work cut out, but I can promise that we will not shy from it. And I hope this conference at the Bologna Book Fair is just the beginning. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, thank you, Lena. I, I, I do hope that this survey will go on because it's important. It will be updated uh, in, in, in years to come because to see if the situation might change. I, I, I don't know if, did you mention the Marsh Award uh, as well for the literary translation of children literacy in translation? Because did you or not? No. Because I think it was, uh, I'm just going, to ask Daniel, is the Marsh Award still going on? Because it used to um, be a... Uh... So, so the Marsh Award was an award every two years for a children's book in translation uh, published in the UK. It hasn't existed for a few years. Um, and I can mention, uh, I'll say something a, a little bit about prizes actually in, in response to Lara when I when I talk, but yes, we don't, um, we don't have one at the moment in the UK. But as you say, the Marsh was around for a while. Okay, no, thank you, just to... To, to, to make sure about it. So, uh, as I said, uh, any question, will, you can put your question on, on the chat box and I will take note of that for, uh, and keep them for the end, until the end of the plenary session. Now, our second, I uh, hand over to our second um, speaker, Kevin Quirk. Thank you very much. Thank you very President much. President um, of FIT. Yes, thank you. I'd like to share my screen, just bear with me for one moment. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Elena Pasoli, uh, Simona Mamberini, for the kind invitation to take part in this uh, very welcome uh, conference and discussion. And to Professor Enrico uh, Terinoni for some inspiration, certainly. Um, he did mention the translation, as you said, uh, um, Simona, uh, is um, perhaps living, but translations translators do need to make a living, um, which is why I've titled this uh, speech, Stand Up for Your Rights as a Translator of Children's Literature. I think it is important that we as translators do stand up and argue for our rights. Uh, there are certain rights that we do need to um, maintain. We do need to um, 
argue these both with in a relationship with um, publishers, publishing houses, um, and in a contra contractual relationship as well, which many people do do forget perhaps. Um, I'll begin by saying, you know, where would we be without translated children's literature? Um, imagine no Harry Potter in your own language, no Roald Dahl, a child in the chocolate factory, as Lara mentioned. And no Lewis Carroll, um, either Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass. Um, it would be a, a rather dismal and, and sad world, I think. Um, or even um, from my own country of exile or adoption, um, Sophie's World by Justin Gorda, several years ago now, but uh, certainly um, a work that, uh, that did have an impression on a lot of young children and young people. Uh, and I think it is important because we are, um, as translators of children's literature and translators of literature in general, doing everybody a great service. Um, it may be considered a glamorous profession, but uh, those people who do craft works in translation, um, and it is, a, um, uh, as uh, the professor said, uh, Professor Enrico um, said, it is, um, you are bound by the, by the text itself. Um, it's a bit of a... Um, uh, a test, a trial, um, and you have to uh, produce exactly the same text in your own language. You have to have the same um, validity, the same uh, sense and sense of feeling. And I think um, a good translator will um, have a sense of co-ownership of a text when they really have achieved a good translation. And I think um, that's an important thing to stick by. But they do, as good translators, uh, deserve greater recognition for the work they do and even an increase in their fees. So how do you go about doing that? Well, I'll come to that in a moment. I just want to um, give you, uh, I'll be slightly personal for one moment and say um, something that I came across quite recently, in fact, um, from Kurt Vonnegut, um, if I can find, yeah. um, who uh, said, if you really want to hurt your parents, uh, the least you can do is to go into the arts. And I'm not kidding. The arts are not a way of to make a living. They're a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing in art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sake. Sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a lousy poem, and do it as well as you possibly can, and you will get an enormous reward. You will have created something. And the act of translation, particularly in literature, really is a creative act. And I think um, it's something that we should never forget. It's something that is unique um, to a certain number of people. Not everybody can do it. As was said, it is a profession. And we should be acknowledged for that, um, recognized by, for one thing, um, awards, certainly. And congratulations to everyone who has won an award, but also to those of you who, who are um, more of a, um, a middling, um, fair to middling, but, but good, good um, translators of essential works throughout the world. I think it's important that we are also recognized in the form of remuneration and proper contracts. But I think also that you need to, to take part in that. So um, going on from what I've just said about uh, Kurt Vonnegut, I at times produce uh, lousy poetry and I will um, burden you with this very briefly. But I have, in, this is about me and my life, I have at various times in my life been a translator of books, a terp, an interpreter for crooks, a teacher and a lecturer too, and I've even been so reactionary that I've co-produced a dictionary. And if you didn't yet know it, I'm a pop-up poet, an occasional charmer and a gentleman farmer, concerned in all instances with my yield. And yes, I have a time. It's been outstanding in my field. And I'm also now the president of FIT, and I travel the world and do my bit. Or rather, I did. Um, of course, now, current travel restrictions, COVID-19, mean that nobody is traveling anywhere. So we're stuck with that. But what about our rights? Um, yes, I am uh, not only president of FIT, I am also part of the... Um, uh, of Seattle, they are not the board, but the the council, um, and I have attended the meetings for um, some ten years. Uh, very happy with that. Also part of the authors' rights um, group, work group there. So uh, I'd like to give you some of the um, the background for this. But uh, FIT has a, um, a memorandum of understanding with Seattle, and we try to um, work on a number of issues, which is why perhaps we've also been invited to this. Why we also took part in the translation of um, uh, the 
children's poet um, Piomini, I think it is, um, last year. I'm very happy with that as well. So, but I'd like to speak to you really about the, the guidelines for fair contracts, which are published by Seattle, um, which I think really do help us to uh, create fair terms and a balanced relationship and good material and moral working conditions for translators. Um, these are available on the Seattle website. Um, so now I'm moving from my own association, my organization and pushing really Seattle, but I think um, what they've done is really of good quality. Um, but it is essential. And now I don't actually know how many of you who are listening are translators or whether you are publishers. Um, I have no major gripe with, um, with publishers and publishing houses, but I think we need to get along. We do need to have formal um, relationship, which is uh, in the form of a contract, in a written form. And there should be typical contact contracts. Um, if they are, if they do exist, these uh, should be negotiated between translators and publishers associations. Um, and both parties should have basic rights and duties, um, obligations. Um, and there should not be a disproportionate contractual power between the parties. Um, I think uh, contractual law uh, states really that you cannot. Um, uh, have a one-sided contract which gives everything to one person. I think most um, jurisdictions, most um, legal jurisdictions would actually throw such um, such contracts out of court, certainly in Norway they would. Uh, but you do need to sit down and have a contract and negotiate that contract um, without duress, without being forced to accept whatever happened. I will just tell you briefly that um, my only claim to fame as a, as a, as a Children, a translator of children's literature, even though it's now classified as uh, non-fiction, um, at least for, for copyright purposes and other purposes, um, is a translation which I did some 20 years ago um, of Norwegian fairy tales. But I was contacted at the time, um, younger and dumber than I am now, certainly, um, by a translation agency and asked if I could just uh, do this uh, over the space of a week and a half almost. Um, a large amount of text, really had to work very quickly with another translator, and we produced a um, translation of Norwegian fairy tales, which was then published. We weren't aware it was going to be published. We, we weren't sure what it was for. Uh, we had no contract. Um, we have no real rights uh, as such now. So um, certainly uh, don't do what I have done. Do not do that. Um, I polled when I was in uh, the US a while back, gave a similar speech. I did poll the, the, the listeners there um, and those who are present. And a lot of people uh, I found were working um, not for a contract. Um, they were not at times even working for pay. Uh, and this is perhaps uh, more typical of Latin America than, um, than North America at the time. But that's certainly a lot of people said, well, we were offered one book and the promise of a second book where there will be, would be paid. Don't ever do that, please. Um, sit down with the publisher and demand your rights and say, listen to them. And don't listen to them when they say, well, we'll, we'll find somebody else. We can take get somebody from the street. That doesn't work. Sorry, I've gone too far. Um, you, are first, you need a licensing of rights and that obligations to the publisher. Um, you must have a specific uh, print run and or time or duration. Um, and if a translator does not receive royalties, the licensing of rights shall have a shorter duration. So if you're not getting royalties, you should not um, be negotiating a, negotiating a contract of, say, 10 years, or nobody should really be doing that now anymore. Um, you should be asking for a shorter duration there. And you must negotiate uh, the rights and the conditions uh, wherever possible. Um, some countries do have um, normal or model contracts that you can use, but you can and negotiate um, your, your way to better remuneration, pay, or better conditions as well. Um, always try to negotiate upwards if you can. Um, but uh, do not um, allow yourself to be exploited um, through the transfer of your rights uh, completely. And uh, certainly do not sign contracts which say that any future technologies um, are the ownership of the, um, the publishers for the forever for the future uh, that's not the way to go you do need to limit uh, what you have and um, certainly a maximum duration of uh, less than 10 years now I think um, the author's rights group have uh, certainly um, uh, restated this as, as it should be almost be it be five years now um, and there should be a reversion clause which means that at any time if the rights the work revert to the author 
then the rights of the translation shall also go back to the translator as well. Because you are a co-author um, in legal terms, really, you have created your own translation, the translated work, which is a copy, if you wish, of the original. You own those words. Um, I don't think I have time to do that, but uh, no, I really have to, uh, to bang on. Um, uh, of course, and you also have moral rights, the right of attribution, which means that you have the, name, the right to have your name um, linked to the work and be recognized as the author of a work. Don't ever accept that your name disappears, um, and it all should also be um, named uh, uh, as many times as possible. If the author is named is mentioned, then your name should be mentioned as well. I know at times it's difficult, but um, uh, I can tell you very briefly that in Japan, the um, there are uh, competing translations of uh, of bestsellers um, that are published uh, at the same time. People can choose um, and. And even uh, the name of the uh, translator is featured on the on the cover of the book, um, even with a sash around it saying this is a translation of such and such, the famous translator. So translators are treated well in Japan. Perhaps that's something we can strive for in Europe as well. You have a right of integrity, which means that um, no changes should be made to your translation without your knowledge and approval, which means you get the proofs back, you read through um, and you make sure that nothing has been changed. Um, this is uh, something you really should stick on. Um, it's, it's important for you. So you will receive the final text for approval before publication. Um, Maybe an editor, but, uh, but you have the right to um, go back to your original if you wish. But do bear in mind that um, uh, the, the reviewer um, and the, the editor should be uh, very well versed in, in what, you, what they're working on and what you're working on. So there should be a good discussion between you. And remuneration, of course, um, a basic fee plus royalties in most countries, certainly. Uh, it doesn't exist in Norway, I'm afraid, but, um, but we do get a higher fee, um, really, which includes the, the royalty um, or the ex expected royalty um, for most, most times as well. These, I think, are important things to, to argue for. Um, and also payment, when you should be paid. Um, don't say that you'll be paid in three months, six months uh, from the date, but as much as possible um, when you sign a contract, uh, but certainly the remainder to be paid uh, no later than 60 days after delivery of the translation. And no extra work should be, should be asked uh, for free by the translator. Um, so essentially no exploitation of the work without remuneration. Uh, I need to go through these very quickly now. I think I'm about to overrun my time perhaps. Uh, can't see now, but um, yeah, certainly. I'll move very much uh, quickly to the end now. Um, no, no publisher should be able to reject the translation. Um, they should have uh, reviewed your translations previously to see you are a prof professional translator and that you know what you're doing. Um, so they shouldn't have no real um, uh, option to, um, to reject it, maybe publish it later, but, uh, but or, or maybe just um, say we don't want to publish it because we don't have the time or the money to do it now. We lost our time slot, for example. Um, that's not acceptable. And you should never be um, asked to guarantee that um, anything libelous or offensive um, in, in, there is in the content uh, written by the author. You're not liable for that at all. Um, so uh, one example, for example, is, um, uh, for example, the works of uh, Salman Rushdie um, in adult literature or more um, grown up literature. Uh, I would urge you to join a professional association. Um, there are many of them represented here today because you will get a direct listing, networking, possibilities for professional development, resources, a code of ethics, most likely. Um, they will help to promote the interests of translators, maybe help you with um, uh, giving you um, uh, a model or guidelines uh, or even distributing the SATA guidelines to you. Um, and I think also um, for your own state of mental health, it is important to be able to speak to other people, like-minded people, people who work in the in the industry or in the profession, and uh, who may be able to help you, mentor you, um, just to speak to you uh, when you need it. I think it is really an important thing. And uh, I think every translator deserves praise. So another one of my lousy poems, which is an ode to translators and of children's literature, belong the children's book fair. 
And on this most momentous day, let bells peal and flagpoles sway. Let's raise our gazes and sing the praises of literary translators in every way. For you are the ones who make thousands of choices while lending your readers your very clear voices, reflecting the cadence and the tone of utterances soppy or dry to the bone. Whether it's text or speech, you do your best. Ask any one of us, it's always a test of your envious strengths as you work your magic on texts highly serious or even most tragic. Whether it's trashy nonfiction or literary greats, you create understanding. You are truly outstanding. You deserve to be praised. You deserve to be proud. And you deserve a poem to be read out loud. So thank you for standing up to your rights. And I do urge you to do so. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Can, can I applaud? Can I ask for a standing ovation of your no, poem? No, no, I'm going. No, I'm going to ask you. Can, can you send it to me? We're going to publish it on a um, children on the Bologna on the book fair website, please. And I'll send you my my PowerPoint. Yes, and maybe maybe yeah. uh, invite other translators to to do a, a, a circular translation as we did for the Pimini project. That's right. Happy, for that. <laughs> thank, Happy. You. thank you. Um, more seriously if uh, all the um, information and, and recommendation you gave are uh, available on the website on the fit website right so uh, Seat. Um, Seat. Seat. Seat, actually in fact on Seat, 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 website. So, okay. Seat stood for most of okay okay this, uh, but fit has worked with them as well so yeah okay fine so there are already some some of the old people want this point, so we want to make sure to, to, to share it and spread it. Thank you very much for the, these important okay, nuts you. and bolts of contracts and rights and so forth. Um, I'll hand over to the next uh, speaker, Marta Morro-Serra from the uh, Croatian Literary Translators Association. Thank you, Simona. Oops, sorry. Okay. Hi, my apologies. Are you following me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, thank you, Simona, and thank you as well, uh, Bologna Children's Book Fair, and also Francesca and Eva for making this roundtable possible. And to all the people who is following us today, it's a pleasure to be here with such excellent uh, panelists. And um, yeah, as uh, Lara was saying, in the years that I have been working as a professional translator of illustrated books for children, I have over time realized that it seems that children's literature compared to adult literature has historically been relegated to a minor category, uh, socially, academically and professionally. Uh, to the detriment of working conditions and rights of translators of children's literature. And I have wondered many times, why is that so? Um, maybe because there's the general belief that the adult world is more serious and important than the children's world, or maybe because children's literature is created for small human beings that have not yet developed all their potential in intellectual capacities. But whatever the reasons are, this does not justify that in the publication of children's books, uh, many publishing companies consistently uh, neglect to use professional standards, such as, for example, not hiring professional translators, not facilitating translator translation contracts, not respecting translators' copyrights, and in some cases, especially when minority languages are involved, uh, translating books from other mainstream languages. And why hire a professional and respect uh, translation copyrights? Uh, first of all, I because children's literature has its own particularities, uh, like uh, orality, rhythms, puns, etc., which makes the translation of children's books really a specialist uh, task. 
Uh, secondly, uh, I think hiring a professional translator is important because when dealing with children's literature, we are dealing also with children's education. And to me, the connection is super clear. Uh, quality education means quality literature and quality literature needs quality translation, which means professional translation. And thirdly, I think hiring a professional and respecting translator's rights is important because uh, hiring a professional translator means that publishing houses are committed to both children who deserve to read good translations and to children's book writers who deserve to be well translated. And sometimes I don't understand why should a publishing company make the effort to choose the best authors, best illustrators and the best stories, but then not hire a professional translation, a translator. And considering the challenges that children's literature present, I think it should be obvious that hiring a professional translator would be the best option uh, for the sake of, of the book. And when all this seems so obvious, then why publishing uh, companies in many cases choose not to go with a professional then? And for me, it sometimes seems that publishing companies uh, forget the important aspects of the first word of their name, publishing, and only worry about the second one, which is company. And uh, thinking that it's all about uh, the money, um, some publishing companies maybe think that paying the fee of a professional translator and respecting translators' copyrights is a waste of money. And well, from, from my point of view, it's actually the other way around because a well-translated book could be a success whilst one that is poorly translated, well, definitely not. And could make the publishing company lose a lot of money. So hiring a professional and respecting translators' rights is economically worth it for both translators and publishing houses. And um, what's the situation uh, in Spain? Um, in Spain, uh, publishing companies that respect translators' copyrights are usually offering the translator the translator 1% or 1.5% of the shares, but recently some of them have been starting to lower them uh, to 0 0.5. Uh, nevertheless, uh, according to some authors and literary, literary agents I've been spoken to, authors' contracts traditionally include 10% of the profits in the original language and 8% for its translations. So according to, to that, um, translators should receive uh, that 2% that is not given uh, to, the, to the author. So um, no law actually states it. It is a fact that responds to the Spanish contractual tradition, but ironically, most of publishing houses don't share the 2% of the profit uh, with translators, which means that they keep it. Uh, but however, there is hope and there is a few publishing houses that do it, such as the Catalan publishing company uh, Raj Bert, who recently um, stated in a Twitter post that they are proud of their translators and that they share the 2% with with them but i i might say that this is a very exceptional uh, case so um, uh, let's recapitulate um in spain the share should be two percent although more often than not it amounts to one percent and to make things worse lately it's been lowering uh, to 0 0.5 and in children's literature translation many publishing companies do not share and uh, any percentage uh, at all. So now I, I will propose you to do an exercise. It's a very simple maths, but that means that translators win one euro out of a hundred, which could be the price of an apple versus the price of a pair of Nikes. <laughs> uh, then we win 10 euro out of a thousand, 
which could be like the price of a pizza versus the uh, a margarita, I'd say, <laughs> uh, versus the price of a plane ticket to Australia. Um, 100 euro out of 10,000, which could be the night, uh, the price of the night in a hotel. Yoohoo, we are going on, on vacations, but uh, that's the, uh, the, the editors have the price of a car. And um, 1,000 euro out of uh, 100,000 which uh, could be the price of a uh, cheap electric bike versus the price of a very expensive uh, Porsche. So I, I know that percentage is not uh, from the net price that publishing companies earn, and it could be argued that distributors are the ones that take the most, the most part of the cake. But still, the magnitude of the difference is daunting. And from my point of view, being asked to have less than 1% reaches the limits of humiliation and really shows the greed of some uh, companies. So the bottom line is that whether we like it or not, professional translators have moral and economical rights under both the, uh, the auspices of the international law, like the Verne Convention and the Nairobi Recommendation, and under many national laws, like in Spain, the intellectual uh, property law. And without going into detail uh, on the articles of these laws, uh, two concepts are at least uh, really clear to me. Uh, and the first one is that these laws state that translators have moral and economical rights. And the second one is that none of them claims that children's literature uh, translation is exempt of them. So they should really be respected. So um, to sum up, uh, children's literature translation, uh, moral and economical rights are under the umbrella of international and national laws. Translators should have a fair share and good contractual conditions because it benefits just not translators, but also the publishing houses who can publish better and more successful books thanks to the work, the work of professional translators and all that would contribute to quality literature, which means quality education, which is something that our world really needs. And that's all uh, from me. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I have to apologize. I said you are the former president of the Croatian literature. I meant Catalan, of course. Literature. Thank you, Simona. Yes, you're right. sorry for that. Um, right. Thank you. There's a, there's a question. Uh, I advise you to, uh, to flag, uh, the, to, to, to write a message to all panelists and all uh, participants. Otherwise, all, only the panelists will see your uh, your message, not all of the participants. There's uh, Le uh, Lena Johnson is ask if you because you haven't mentioned we, we translators are paid per page or per keystroke, so you didn't mention the uh, the pay for uh, apart from the royal royalties. How much mm. do you get normally um, paid for a page or or keystroke or whatever? Mm. Usually in uh, illustrated books for uh, children, uh, there's like a minimum fee because if you get paid per, um, if you get paid per word, uh, that could be a disaster <laughs> economically. And, uh, and but it depends, it ranges like, it depends as well on the language combination because if it's, uh, in Spain, if it's Catalan Spanish, it can be that low uh, as uh, say 60 euro. But then, um, uh, but usually the minimum, minimum, usually it's 120 if it's a very short uh, book. But then you, there. You talk about Picture books, picture books. So you don't, yeah, you don't exactly. usually don't get paid by page or words. No, no. Picture books, you have a, 
uh, uh, you decide beforehand how much do you pay me for this. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You usually consider the difficulty if it, it has rhythms or not, well, rhymes, sorry, um, and depending on the, the difficulty of it, you estimate how many hours you will have to work on it and you will give like a uh, rate. But the lowest one that should be should be 120, I would say, but there are some um, publishing companies that can give you 350 for one book or even 500. In the, it depends really, like the rate is so huge. Mm -hmm. But yeah. as for novels, when where you are paid per page or per word, how, what is the medium rate or the, the average rate for? For for novels, they usually pay per page, and I've heard like English into Spanish or Catalan. Uh, the minimum it should be fourteen, but I've heard that there are some publishing companies that are paying less, and a good uh, fee would be like. 16 or 17 the maximum but yes. for for japanese for instance it's different for japanese into catalan spanish could be 25 27. yes of course it depends on the difficulty of the language yeah but okay so let's it's keep not it worth it. It. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll continue this discussion at the end of the session. Now the next speaker, uh, to the next speaker, Lena Jansson from the Swedish board of the uh, Writers' Union you know, Translation Translator section. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me, uh, taking part in this seminar and also thank you to the previous speaker, speakers. It's been very interesting to listen to you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the conditions for translators of children's and young adult literature in the four Nordic countries, that is Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway and Sweden. Uh, I myself have mostly translated young adult fiction. Uh, I have quite short time to talk about four countries, so I hope you bear with me if I'm speaking quickly and showing a lot of slides in this short time. Uh, and before I start also, I want you to consider that uh, I have had uh, only a few respondents. I've made interviews with people in these four countries, uh, but they have been very experienced translators. So I think they are pretty re uh, reasonably uh, representative anyway. Uh, but I myself know Sweden best, of course, so I speak maybe a little more about Sweden. When I started this uh, investigation, I, what I found, I thought that we would be pretty similar in the Nordic countries, but I found surprisingly ma very many differences. Uh, so I will guide you through this. But I also of course, we also have very many similarities, and I'll start with the similarities. Uh, and I hope that you see my pictures now. Simona, can you do it? Yes, up? yes, yes, that's perfect. Yes. Thank you. I had some problems in the beginning. <clears throat> well, first of all, we have to say that we are small countries with small uh, languages, which means that we have pretty stable markets, especially for children's literature. And uh, it's also a fact that the national literature is uh, given precedence in our countries. I think that we, in general, have fair contracts, according to what uh, Kevin just told us about, uh, in all of our countries. Uh, I also found out that we mostly have professional editing from the publishing houses. Uh, there is in-house translating happening at times, but I don't think it's very usual, actually. That's what I've heard. And a few of my respondents were very much in the pandemic <laughs> when they answered my questions. And they, they, they told me that 
there, we haven't seen very much of a pandemic effect. <clears throat> if there has been any effect, it's been that there have been a little more books translated during these two years than before. Literary translators in general are always freelance. We belong to the precariat. Uh, as several of you have said before, or all of you have said before, the fees are lower for this kind of literature. The prestige is lower. And I think most of my, all, all my respondents have said that it's impossible to make a living from only translating this kind of, of literature, which makes the public lending rights very important for the for this category of translators, uh, for the individual translator. Royalties are rare. They pretty much do not exist in our countries for translations at all. Uh, and what we have seen uh, lately uh, is that uh, foreign publishers, especially American, are trying to change our markets, which is not a good thing. And I, I'll come back to that <laughs> because they also affect the, the national publishers. As I, I didn't mention before, but Norway is exceptional. Uh, that's the, there, there is the biggest difference between Norway and the other three countries. Norway, have, they have better pay. The translators have better pay. But we also have to consider that they have higher cost of living. But still, they have better pay. And as far as I understand, there's no genre difference uh, in the pay that get, they get in Norway. And in Norway, the PLR, the public lending rights, are paid to schol a scholarship fund, not to individual translators. And as I understand, there is also now a royalties <coughs> for audiobooks in the new standard contract. Right, Kevin? Kevin is nodding. <laughs> uh, from here on, I'll make a very a short and sketchy comparison of the six subject contracts, fees, royalties, and PLR, negotiating powers, visibility, and grants and prices. My oral presentation is mostly a summary of what I have found. And on the pictures, on the slides, you'll see more of what my respondents have said. <clears throat> and I guess uh, you will get the, the presentation later. Contracts are mostly written in all of our countries. And they are often standard or model contracts. Uh, and oral contracts are not uncommon, even though. Uh, there can be email contracts, email conversations as contracts, which is a sort of hybrid, but I think you have to consider those as written contracts. All countries except Finland, they have, we have collectively negotiated contracts one way or another. <clears throat> Collective agreements are in general use, or they can at least function as models for the market. Uh, <clears throat> in Finland, written contracts are not always used, but publishers have their own model contracts, especially bigger, bigger publishers. And the market that I know best is Sweden, as I said, and our standard contract is, it fulfills almost all the, the, the requirements of what Kevin uh, told us about the, the hexalog, the CATL hexalog. Uh, we have uh, fees that are minimum fees that are reasonable, and they are hiked once a year according to a salary index. There's a time limit of seven to eight years for copyright usage. Money is paid for secondary usage according to the contracts. We have a last word clause. The transparency, trans transparency could be better. We are not always notified if we, ha we have a right to secondary uh, remuneration. And I also want to mention that the collective agreements are being renegotiated right now in both Sweden and Iceland. <clears throat> as for fees, as you all have said, uh, the fees are lower for translators of children's and uh, young adult literature in all of our countries except Norway. Um, and they are generally on the minimum level in the, of the model contracts. Uh, fees should be paid, as I said, for secondary usage, but if if we translators are not notified, we cannot demand to have that, that fee. And uh, then we don't get that, even if it's in the contract. As Marta was talking about before, 
uh, for books with little text or picture books, we often get lump sums, which pay better, of course, and those are decided in uh, individual contracts. There is no collective contracts for such books. In Finland, all fees are individually negotiated uh, and they get no, no or little extra money for secondary usage. Uh, my experience is that for young adult literature, <clears throat> the fees are usually on the minimum level and it's difficult to hike them. The best option is to try to get a high initial fee. For example, by first translating an adult book for the same publisher, then you, then you stay on the same, same high level if you get a book for young adult readers. <clears throat> when it comes to royalties, as I said, we don't get any royalties. Uh, I once myself managed to get a royalty for a, a bestseller for audio for a bestseller. But I, 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 don't, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone getting royalty for translations in Sweden. Uh, but as, as I said, in Norway, you get royalty for audio books. <clears throat> because of the lower fees, public lending rights are very important financially for the individual. But it is kind of a lottery because <clears throat> even if you can get more money from PLR for the same book than you got from the in the, the original contract, you never know. It's a lottery and it, it comes as a ple pleasant surprise if you get more money from the PLR. Here in Sweden, it used to be that we had the PLR money in the beginning of December, which was very good for Christmas presents. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's nothing you can count on financially if you are a professional uh, translator. In Denmark, children's and young adult literature have lower PLR than for adult literature. And as I said, in Norway, the PLR money doesn't go to the individual, but to a fund. <clears throat> when it comes to negotiating powers, uh, part of the negotiating powers, which I didn't think of when I wrote this, but the <clears throat> is that you have a legal backup, which is a very important part of being a member of the Translators Association, because there you can get help with negotiation. And if you need damages or anything like that, it's very good to because you can get the legal backup. But in general, the individual translator doesn't <clears throat> really have very strong negotiating powers, but we do have some strong associations in the Nordic countries, especially in Norway and Sweden, I think. Uh, in Norway, there are two very strong translators associations that negotiate for the translators as a collective with the publishers organizations. And the standard contracts are in use, <clears throat> which in itself is a strength for the translators. In Sweden, our union negotiates for translators as a collective for standard contracts. But on the publisher side, there is no collective party to negotiate with now anymore. And they used to be, but not now. So we negotiate along, uh, along two lines, we can say. We, one with the very biggest publishing company, Bonnier, uh, where we have one set of negotiations for a special kind of contract. And then with the other, next to biggest uh, publishers, we, we negotiate to renew our old standard contract, which is used by most of the market except Bonnier. And I'd say we are still pretty strong in Sweden as well. Both in Iceland and Denmark, they have collective negotiations for contracts, but maybe they are not, the contracts are maybe not as respected as they are in Norway and Sweden. In Finland, translators are very much alone in negotiations. The publishers in Finland don't accept to, to negotiate with their organizations, with translators' organizations. Well, visibility. The translator's name is printed in books, but mostly not on the cover, only on the title page. And this goes for all the countries. Small publishers have started to have translators on the cover in both Denmark and Sweden. <clears throat> Also in Iceland, translators are sometimes printed on the cover. Uh, but translators' names are seldom given in marketing and often forget, forgotten in reviews. And when it comes to prices and grants, 
There are prizes for ch children's literature and ad young adult literature in all countries uh, for translated books, often in cooperation with IBBY, as that's Lara talked about. But there are also several national prizes and awards for translators and translations, as well as possible to give general translation awards to children for young adult literature, which has happened a few times in Sweden, actually. In Norway, as we heard, there are two big translators prizes for, for children's literature. Uh, the Norwegian Association of Literary Translators awards the Bastian Prize, which sometimes includes money. And the Ministry of Culture has a translation award for children's and young adult literature, uh, which always includes money. Uh, and one of those is just given every second year, I don't remember which. Iceland has four awards for children's or young children's literature, uh, <clears throat> which of which one, the Reykjavik Children's Book Awards is only for children's, only for translations. But there are also three other awards that are for literature in general, authors and for translations. Also, <clears throat> there are grants for children's and young adult literature from arts foundations in Denmark and Iceland. And in the other countries, it's possible to get grants for translations in general. To conclude my speech, I want to, I want to say what others have said. We have to fight uh, to try to get our work higher valued uh, because translations and translators of children's and young adult literature are, literature are undervalued in, spe in spite of that kind of work is often much more demanding than translating adult literature. We have in Sweden been talking about maybe trying to get common standards for fees, for example, for picture books or books with little text. That could be a way forward. But what we have, from what we have seen in the last years in the Nordic countries, we must fight unfair contracts uh, that are often inspired by the American legal the American market and the American legal environment with unfair contracts, buyout agreements where the translator doesn't keep any rights, lower fees <clears throat> and uh, not no right to last word and no transparency, etc. That the American companies, companies do this is one thing, but the worst thing is that national publisher com publishing companies mimic this, which we have seen in Sweden uh, with the biggest publishing company we have. So that was all I had to say. And I want to thank my Nordic colleagues who helped me with this information. And I also want to thank you who listened to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, I've heard that apart from the Norway, the, the um, it's Netherlands is another paradise for translators, but I think they are the two main uh, countries uh, who that treat better treat the, uh, the translators. Um, now we'll switch to, to Daniel Han and what's the situation in the UK with regard to all these issues. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. It's it's uh, it's lovely to be here in um, not in Bologna, but but pretending to be in Bologna. It is the, the next best thing. Um, I would rather, obviously, be eating ice cream at the bottom of an escalator with you, but um, which is mostly what Bologna consists of in my in my memory. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the UK and, and a bit about the, the rest of the English speaking world only because translators who work into English tend to work across the, across the territories, across the, the, the markets. Um, and the UK is uh, the UK is a quite different case from the rest of Europe, um, which is not something that will come as a surprise to you and not something that you've never heard before. Um, and one of the ways in which the UK, I think, is a very different case is um, the, the problems that the translators face, I think, are quite, are quite different. Uh, on the whole, um, conditions for work are not too bad. A lot of the things that Lena was talking about, like reasonable contracts, like professional editing, uh, like you know, public lending right, all of those things exist in the UK, and they're mostly um, quite robust. Um, pay is not terrible. Uh, pay for 
sort of long form prose tends to be the same as for adult fiction, for example. Um, so that's the, the kind of uh, observed minimum from our association is about 95 pounds for a thousand words. Um, we count words rather than, than pages or keystrokes, but it's a reasonable, it's not, you know, riches beyond imagining, but it's a reasonable amount of money. Um, and as other people have said, I think Martha said particularly for picture books, obviously you, the, the, the rates are not by word, they are kind of by project, they're kind of fixed. Um, I think the least I've been paid for a picture book translation for something very basic was about 200 pounds, which is to say 240 euro. Usually it's um, uh, the kind of normal is 300 pounds, 350 euro. Um, and sometimes it's quite a bit more than that. Um, there are royalty, clauses. Um, there aren't always royalties, but there are always royalty, almost always royalty clauses, except sometimes for the most basic, uh, the kind of simplest picture books. Um, and when I say there are royalty clauses rather than royalties, it's because often the royalty uh, is, is contracted to kick in at a certain point, and that threshold doesn't always get reached. So it, the royalty kicks in after we sell 5,000, 10,000 copies, or it kicks in after the advance has been earned out or, or, or whatever. Um, so in, in kind of symbolic terms, th there's almost always a royalty clause, which I think is important. Sometimes that leads to actual uh, real money and sometimes that, that doesn't. Um, but again, going back to what Lena said, public lending right is potentially uh, one of the things that helps to, to kind of prop that up. Um, so the conditions mostly uh, are, are, are as good as they are for translators of adult books, um, which is to say not too bad and uh, and improving. Um, we don't have a prize for children's books and translation. Simona kindly remembered the, the Marsh Award, which we had for quite a long time and which was discontinued a few years ago. Um, I, uh, well, I think the things that Lara said about prizes are really important. Um, there are some reasons why I think they're less of an issue in the UK and I'm not I'm not hugely exercised about not having a translated uh, a translation for children prize here, but I will say something about uh, why that is um, in in a moment. Um, the problem we have here uh, is not so much the the conditions of the work, um, so much as the amount of work. Um, the the amount that gets published for children in translation is tiny in this country. And this is an absolutely enormous market in terms of the number of books, the number of individual titles published, uh, children's books being a significant part of that and being a, mostly a thriving part of that. Um, and in terms of the, the, the sort of, um, well, yes, I, I think, um, I wish we had, we, ha we haven't got very robust data on this and I wish we did, but to give you some idea, there was a program a few years ago, the Book Trust ran called In Other Words, that was done uh, partly with some events in at Bologna. And uh, it was announced a few days ago that the, I think it was the sixth title to come out of that project uh, was published in translation in the UK. And it's great, and it's a great project, and I was proud to be involved in it. And those six books are all books that I'm excited that we have. But the fact that a project was able to create with quite a lot of money and quite a lot of effort, an addition of six books into this enormous market. And those six books feels like a really big deal, gives you some sense of the scale, how little is being, is being published in translation for children. There are reasons uh, that we, I think, can probably guess. Some of them are historical. Um, Lara, I think, referred to how much of what's translated into other places comes from English. And so, of course, that uh, is, is one of the reasons for the imbalance. Um, there are relatively few channels now um, for kind of big mainstream publishers to acquire books from abroad. Um, it feels like a risk when we're talking to publishers about buying books that they on the whole aren't able to read. Um, and also because of the way that the, the children's book uh, publishing market has evolved in the last decade or so, which depends for its promotion largely on authors doing school visits on authors doing festivals on authors being the people who are out on the road promoting their books if the author doesn't speak english and is five thousand miles away that thing which on, on which publishers have come to depend as a way of promoting their books is kind of completely removed from the from the equation so we're talking about very very small numbers we're talking about a, a very limited number of publishers who are doing this it's very often the same few small publishers 
Pushkin Press doing uh, fiction, for example, or an independent publisher, Book Island, a very tiny, very brilliant independent publisher doing, uh, doing picture books. But in the UK, it's, the, it's a tiny handful of publishers who are doing uh, a, a lot of the work. The result of this really small, uh, these really small numbers for translators um, is first, of course, there is very little work, which is to say that even those of us who, I, I think of myself as someone who specializes in, in children's books, and it's a thing that I uh, love more than anything, um, but I couldn't begin to spend most of my time doing it. There isn't enough work. There aren't any translators who only work on books for children. There are a few who do quite a bit, but I think all of us who do quite a bit still are doing uh, mostly other things. There simply isn't enough work. One of the things that goes with that is that there aren't very many uh, people with expertise. Um, there aren't very many people with expertise means there aren't a lot of people that to, to make the case. Um, when you have panels on children's books and translation uh, in the UK, um, it's usually the same four or five people. I am one of those incredibly boring people who always pops up as one of the handful of people who has views on this subject. It, it's a very, it's a very kind of small group of, of expertise. And that also means then that there are very, very few translators with experience, um, with specific experience translating books for children or young adults. And so I was approached recently by a publisher who acquired a, a book um, from a language they had never published before. And they said, can you recommend a, a translator from this language um, who, who works on children's books? And I had to say, well, I think we translated one book from this language for children in the last five years. And I can tell you the person who did that, but there isn't someone who has been a specialist in this kind of translation who knows the UK market in children's literature as well as the, 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 the translated from market. So there is a kind of extra downside, not only that we don't have work, but also there isn't this kind of expertise within the profession. Um, and we need to find a way of balancing, you know, training more tra translators to be able to do this kind of work, this, which has its really particular demands, while also not training lots of translators for whom um, essentially there is no work for them when they come out of the end of the training. Um, and so one of the things that we have to figure out is uh, increasing the amount rather than increasing the quality, I think. Uh, that's part of the focus. Um, and part of that is to do with the visibility for the things that do exist. Um, and one of the, and this comes back to, to um, the thing that Lada was saying about prizes, because I slightly perversely think um, I, I want to improve the visi visibility of children's books and translation, and I don't really want a prize for one. Because actually, while I was very happy to have the Marsh Award, which is this award we had for about 20 years, the thing that I think we need most of all is for translations to be included in, if you like, the mainstream prizes, if you like, the normal prizes, um, which get far more attention, which get far more column inches in newspapers, they get far more kind of oxygen of publicity. Um, around the time the Marsh Award stopped, the Carnegie Medal, which is unquestionably the most important prize in the UK for writing uh, children's books, began to allow translations to be included alongside English language books. And actually, I think I would much rather, in a sense, have the sort of mainstream prizes that get attention, have translations in there. Last year, a translation um, published by Pushkin was shortlisted for the Carnegie Medal. This year, uh, indeed this week, um, a translation from Swedish is, is on the shortlist for the Greenway Medal, which is the illustrator, it, kind of half of that, of that pair, the Greenway Medal, which also now allows, um, which also allows translations to be included. So one of the things that I'm keen on actually is um, rather perversely not trying to create an interest in translated books while, by not drawing attention to them as a distinct thing. Because what we need in the UK is children's books and translation to be mainstream, children's books and translation to be normalized and so forth. Um, there's a curious, uh, again, there's a kind of curious paradox about trying to draw attention to something by not drawing attention to it. Um, when it comes to things like how translators get credited, I, in th there are a fair number of adult publishers that put a uh, translator's name on the cover of the books. There are very few children's publishers that put translators' names on the covers of books. Um, but again, one of the arguments is we're, try we're trying not to 
make these things look different. You want this brilliant Norwegian book to be next to Harry Potter and next to whatever else, next to Dahl, um, rather than drawing attention to the things that make it different. And I'm ambivalent about this in one sense, but I think that there is a kind of practical reason for, for taking advantage of the oxygen of publicity that comes with, for example, the, the, the really big prizes. So there are um, a number of initiatives that uh, are in, in play and have been in play to increase the visibility of children's books in translation and to increase the demand um, for the visibility. There are things like the World Kid Lit, there are things like the In Other Words program, which I mentioned, um, a, a, a publisher thing I did um, in partnership with Bologna a couple of years ago. Um, and, and I think it's also worth mentioning, just as my last point, that all of these initiatives, one way or another, have translators um, either driving them or at least at their, at their kind of heart. Um, because one of the things, as everyone on this call will know, that translators often have to be the, the advocates for translation because no one else will do it. And so a lot of what's happened uh, in the last few years, uh, insofar as some progress has been made um, in, in increasing the number and the visibility of children's book translation in the UK and to some extent elsewhere in the English speaking world, has been translators um, setting up initiatives and raising money and uh, making noise and uh, annoying people in a relentless kind of way until they give up and do what we tell them. Um, uh, I think that's it. That, that's, that's the sort of summary. We have, a, we have a, a quantity problem rather than a quality problem, mostly. Um, and we are slowly, slowly chipping away at that problem, but a little too slowly for my liking. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. I was thinking about uh, initiatives um, by translators, and is it still, uh, I know, a beautiful, wonderful project um, led by, by Sarah Rizzoni to go to schools and create a readership uh, for a children's book in translation, because in the English speaking world, there's still this wariness, this, it, it's, it's suspicious, it's like the, the, the product in translation, it's, it, you have still, do you still have uh, issues in convincing people that a book in translation is as good as a book written in English or in Europe? I don't think we have that problem at all. I mean, obviously in a, a small handful of cases, we're never gonna get over that. I don't think we have that problem at all. And I don't really think we ever had the problem as much as people think we did. I think one of the problems we have is there are a lot of people who think other people have that problem. And because publishing, publishing for children especially, but all kinds of publishing is about people second guessing what other people are going to like, what other people are going to be scared of, what other people are going to be resistant to. It means that a lot of the time you go, you know, well, of course we love this, but you know what, you know what they're like. They're going to think that, you know, the color palette looks different from the things that they're used to. And so it's going to be a little bit weird. And so much of this is about, um, there is, a, I don't know whether it's, it is just projection or whether it is simply people assuming that there is a kind of anxiety somewhere else. Um, I don't think we have any problem with children uh, having any sort of resistance to, to work in translation. Um, not least because if you're working in English, English is, is not a small language. English is spoken right across the world and English books written in English, not in translation, are often going to be culturally much more different to books that happen to be written in Dutch, but come from the Netherlands, happen to be written in Norwegian, come from Norway. Um, so I don't think we actually have that problem, but I think there are still some places, um, and, and we see this in picture books, perhaps more than old, older fiction, um, where there is a kind of a fear that that might exist, that some somebody else might have this um, have this resistance, which is one of the arguments given by some publishers of adult books who don't want to put translator names on the cover, because they think, well, what if, what if it frightens them? What if people think, you know, I, I want to read a proper book, a good, you know, English language book, like you know, the Bible, um, for example. Um, so there, there is a kind of there, there is that that sense, I think, of of. Uh, deferred um mm -hmm. or, or projected anxiety i don't yeah. i don't think anyone has this problem really okay yeah, i'm glad to hear that we have to speed up because we're running out of time so let's go to france valerie the Punec from 
the French Literature Translators Association and Secretary of CERTEL. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here and very glad that this forum is happening because uh, it goes to show how how much work there still is in that uh, in that uh, in this field. And I hope it will inspire uh, all of our associations to work with the with the domain of uh, publishing for children's for, for children's books and um, help uh the situation of uh, those translators uh i won't spend a lot of time talking about the conditions uh fees etc in france because it is uh, it would be very re repetitive with uh, what has been already said i will just say quickly that um in france the, the situation of uh, translators of novels is um not too bad uh, the average price, per, the, the average fee per page is a bit lower than in adult literature still. Uh, it's about one euro lower, but some books in, ch in uh, children's literature are a bit quicker to translate. And also you can, it's the opposite of, uh, of the UK. You can have a lot of work and you can work very regular, regularly, especially on series. Also, the PLR are really interesting, and so you can make a living translating novels for young adults or children. Um, in the case of illustrated books and albums for the smaller ages, um, there are a lot more problems, which have already been discussed here in different uh, by different um, persons. The percentages are very low, of often less than one percent when there's a percentage at all. Of course, the name of the translator is generally in the colophon, very, very small. And um, there is some, there are some uh, publishers who do the translation themselves for free, for fun, you know, sometimes. It is not the general case. There are also a lot of very serious publishing houses that work well. But the thing is, when a translator tries to negotiate, um, the publisher often explains that it's a small market. The retail price cannot get very high because it's parents buying books for children um, the fabrication costs are high and they, they also have to pay for the publishing rights all things that are true but what happens is that the publisher does their calcu calcu calculations and their, they factor in their margin which doesn't move and uh, then the translation cost is the variable that's what we see all the time and so the publisher says hey that's all i have left to pay you for this for this book <laughs> so although all their reasons are true um it doesn't explain why the translation absorbs the 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 difference in uh, cost for the publisher see what i mean it's uh, it's always the translation cost that is uh, squeezed um probably because uh, we don't have much leverage you know it's something that the publisher cannot do with the printer or with the agent or whoever else so that's a problem uh, but what i wanted to address here more specifically is um, uh, several aspects of the, that diminished status of the uh, translator of children's literature uh, who is often viewed, as we have said, as a minor translator. And uh, I wanted to address some more specific as aspects of that. One is um, the translator is often seen as a substitute of the author uh, and a lesser one, of course, in the media or at events in the world of publishing, festivals, uh, book fairs, etc. When a translator of general literature for adults is invited to talk, He's invited to talk specifically about translation, generally speaking, about their relationship with the author and with the text. A translator of children's literature, on the other hand, is generally invited when the author cannot be at the event, or when inviting the author would be too costly, or when the author is present, as he's sometimes used as an interpreter, and often for free. Uh, the translator is invited to talk about the book or to receive, to receive a prize on behalf of the author. 
um, to thank the public on behalf of the author, <laughs> but the translation work in itself is not considered challenging or interesting enough to be talked about, except in teaching situations like workshops and classes or in uh, translation slams that we, our organization at TLF organizes, uh, for example, at the um, Salon of uh, Montreuil, the SLPJ. Uh, I also find it very revealing that there isn't any prize for the translation of children's literature in France, although there are very prestigious awards for writers and illustrators of children's literature, especially in a field where, where there is so much translation, the, the, the part of translation in the market is uh, huge, and um, that is something we will have to work on in the near future, because for the moment, you may be an extraordinary translator, still you cannot hope to get any recognition, really. Um, and that status, uh, that minor state status, makes it very difficult for someone who has translated a lot of books for children to find work translating for adults. Uh, that is also something that uh, we've noticed with the um, conversations with a lot of our colleagues. Publishers find it hard to trust us with a grown-up text, uh, and uh, it is hard to uh, graduate. Well, it is seen like that. It's seen as graduating to adult literature, which is not normal and shouldn't be seen like that. Uh, however, it is also different. It it it, it works both ways because uh, um, publisher publishers of children's books will also want uh, specialized translators and will uh, um, some uh, translators for adults are frustrated because they would like to do children's literature and uh, they also cannot find a uh, publisher who will trust them for that. So I, I would uh, nuance a little bit uh, the question here. And at last, there's another more specific and probably more um, difficult issue that I wanted to address here. That is our status within the world of children's book publishing. Uh, it has come to our attention at, uh, at TLF that sometimes translators are viewed by the national authors of children's books, not as fellow authors, but as the competition. Uh, I'd be very curious to know if you have seen that in your, in your countries too. Um, we have begun to notice it two, three years ago when a series of discussions about the condition of author, uh, authors were launched, uh, national discussions, uh, panels, um, negotiations, beginning of negotiations between um, the uh, associations representative of authors and the publishers and the government and so on. And this is still ongoing, but um, we have a lot of talk about representation and etc. lobbying. And uh, at that occasion, there were a lot of tweets and, and social co comments in the social media and so on. And um, interviews of authors and representative uh, uh, authors associations. And in some of those, we where am I? Um, in the world of children's book publishing, some authors were wary of translated literature, which, which they saw as a threat, even though they themselves benefit, benefit from being translated too. And we realized that translators were not always welcome among them, and certainly not part of their world. I'm not sure whether the same thing exists in general literature, but I think it is certainly more common in children's lit because it's a smaller circle of people and a smaller, more competitive market. Uh, I will take one example, which also contributed to make us aware of that problem or question. Um, there's a wonderful operation in France called Les Petits Champions de la Lecture for the promotion of reading among school children. It's a competition where children in classes choose the text they want to read aloud and they have a local tournament and then regional and then nas a national final. It's absolutely great and I don't want to criticize that operation at all, but um, I wanted to mention it in, this, in the context of this forum as an example, because a few years ago, we, our translators association, association contacted them because we wanted to, we thought it would be great to partner up with them but we were told that uh, there would be no translated works in the national final, and therefore there we were not relevant. Uh, 
uh, one reason they gave us was that the finalists were to meet and talk with the authors. Fair enough. We couldn't convince them that meeting translators could be interesting as well. Which brings us back to my previous point of translators being seen as only substitutes of the authors. But I also think there was an element of a promotion in the events, promotion of our authors, our national authors, um, from which translators, of course, were excluded. So I brought this up only to illustrate the fact that whereas translators of general literature have largely managed to be perceived as authors per se, it is not yet completely the case for tra translators of children's literature, I think. So that's, that was about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And before going to uh, Germany, can I, I just ask you one question uh, about pension? Sorry, but it's my day fix. To my knowledge, I think that in France, you're the only uh, association who has made pension contribution. A private one or associate, uh, yeah, we do the association, yeah, yes. So, you do. No, it's not that that's uh, it's not for all. <laughs> I mean, I think it's the to my knowledge, it's the only situation I know. I don't know, maybe in Germany, and we'll see about it. Uh, I'll ask that question to Alexander Wack from the German Association of German Literary Translators, starting we've from this we've... question. Even just a yep. question, we have the national, we, we, we have, we pay part of a pension, which is the, the basic national pension. So that's on each of our contracts. We, we pay a, a small percentage for that. And we also have a complementary pension. Um, the Sofia, no? To... No, no. Sofia contributes, Sofia, Sofia helps, is the PLR, and it helps, helps us pay that pay for that. But no, we also have a mandatory complementary um, pension fund uh, with uh -huh. a different percentage um, uh, according to your earnings. If you earn little, you do, you have a smaller percentage to pay. Yeah. And if you earn more, you have a bigger. But still, you have this option. that uh, we... we have this option, yes. Uh -huh. In, in Germany? <laughs> Yes. In Germany, we've got it as well. Um, so, but you have to do it on your own. It's not automatically. So you have to decide to to go in the pension. It's a Künstler Sozialkasse, and then it's the same as in France that um, yearly you have to say what your um, amount will be. You will earn, and then you you pay monthly for that. So, so we can give the screen to um, to Alexandra, please, uh, Arianna. Next speaker, Ra Alexandra Rack. So, well, I can't start even if I'm only small, can I? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, hi, hi everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm talking about to today, give you a short insight of the German book market and the working conditions with the focus on children and youth literature. The numbers you will hear are from uh, well, if I translate it, book and book trade in numbers um, published last year, though mostly the numbers are from 2019 and uh, the survey, our association VDU, um, it's from 2019 and the new one will come out shortly after that. So sorry, but <laughs> I can't be um, more actual. Uh, so I share my screen, hopefully. Not yet. Yes. 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 Um, so first, the good thing: 2019, the sales uh, of the book industry, the the whole book industry in Germany, amounted up to 9.2 billion euro. To give you a comparison, for example, the music industry ha had 1.6 billion euros, or computer and video games, which are highly, you know, oh, the new new thing is, is uh, the topic that says had 3.8 million. So really books, 9.2 billion euro. After fiction, like you can see on this slide, children's and youth literature is the second most important with a category of 17% um, of the turtle tone over. In this um, category, um, so we don't have uh, the problem like the UK. Um, 
nearly 8,000 books were um, published and uh, 1,600 translation. So there's, um, there's quite a lot to do. In the first year of the pandemic in the German book market recorded a decline in sales of 2.3%, but children's book uh, had an increase of 4.7%. So with all the lockdown and school closed, parents thought, I buy a book for my child. Um, so it all sounds pretty good. And uh, if everyone got their fair share, we could all be happy, but we are far from it. Um, the, the way the VDU um, has uh, done showed that the average page fee is um, nearly 19 euro and a children's book is 60, 16 euro 50 cent. Um, so um, like you said before, uh, picture books are usually paid um, with a fixed um, with a fixed price and um, yeah, starting from children's books to young adult, um, you get a page free. And the reasons why that is so, we already heard uh, the lower retail price, the translator gets squeezed in, or um, it's often considered to be easier to translate. In um, Germany, um, the highest court, um, the Bundesgerichtshof, BDH, BGH, um, has a minimum requirement for sales share, you can see there. And um, even if it's said by court, 45% of all contracts for the first edition and following paperback are below this minimum requirement. So that's all you get to see from this. Um, we translators um, have the right uh, to insist on adjustments to the contract, but in re reality, many of us are careful because we fear that no new contracts will follow. If you push too much, um, yeah, they won't contact us again. And it will not surprise you to hear that this is something many publishers count on. So for us translators, it's a bit a matter of sink or swim. We translators don't really feel that we've got negotiation power. Colleagues told me uh, that very often it is only the page fee they can negotiate and everything else is fixed. Perhaps sometimes we are often too careful. Uh, I always for myself ask the editor to send me the draft um, to, to, to show that it is exactly that, a draft, not, you know, something finished. Um, yeah, small things I can negotiate. Uh, and if it gets difficult, she's not the one doing the negotiation. So it gets pushed to the right departments. And well, if, you, if you're on that department, you know, okay, you, you can't change anything. But anyway, you have to try. Um, yeah, other colleagues are tired from fighting, though if they get the contract, you usually get the contract. If they get the contract, um, they only look for the page fee and sign it. And um, well, especially beginners are easily pulled over the barrel um, because from their point of view, it's, um, well, it's understandable because they want to gain a foothold, you know, to, to have a name. And, and then they're saying, oh, the second or the third time, I will get a bit um, a higher fee. Unfortunately, in Germany, representative action from our association cannot be taken. That is something we still fight for. And I think some of the publishing houses would change their behavior then if that would be possible. The Bastei Lübeck Group, for example, is known for their bad contracts. The page fee usually is all right, everything else not. And it's known uh, in without translators for a year and nothing changes. Um, what you ask, um, Simona, though the translators only earn 55% of the annual, annual income um, of all the people in Germany, though that's about 9,000 euro and the monthly 
pension expectation is about 700 euro. So only to live from translation is still really difficult. Um, yeah, it's still a lot to do and um, not to, to be driven into poverty when you're old and want to retire. On the positive note, you can say that uh, translators are more visible on books. Some 15 years ago, only very famous translators were named on the cover of books. So for example, Mirjam Pressler and Andreas Steinhöfel, because they were also known as brilliant authors. And then uh, the publishing houses did marketing with these names. Uh, today, translators are not so much found on the cover of the books, well, the inside title, sure. Um, but it happens more often that you find uh, also a short biography of the translator following um, the authors. And um, editors are quite open-minded for suggestions. Um, once I had a children's book and, well, I never would ask, you know, can you do that if they don't do it at all? But um, they had, following the author, they had the illustrator with only a cover and a few uh, small vignettes. And then I asked for the second book, well, if the illustrator is, um, had a biography, can you put me as well? So no problem. They, they often don't think of it, but it's possible. Well, as we all know, um, oh no, uh, something Kevin um, said, um, the, the, the balance between um, duties and rights. Um, usually in contracts, every company has a different contract. And if you read it, you really have to have a long breath, um, very much pages with uh, small printing. And uh, we all got the impression that, that we have got a lot of duties uh, and we have to search for our rights. Um, so yeah, we all know that uh, to be heard, you must be seen. And uh, 2009, the World Reading Stage um, was founded. That is an open network with events in Berlin, Frankfurt, Freiburg, Hamburg, Cologne, Zurich, um, who wants to show international literature and their often unknown co-authors, co the translators. Two years later, a group of translators um, founded the Young World Reading Stage. So far, um, mostly translators living in Berlin. And in the year of the pandemic, the Frankfurt section of the World Reading Stage worked hard um, so that some events went digital and the German voices of various authors now can be found on YouTube. But there again, um, children books translators are not so numerous yet. So for us literary translators in Germany, there's still a long way to go, I think. Um, but hopefully we will find our own wonderland and can come back to rea reality and um, can make a good living from our profession and that in not a too distant future. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> thank you. And um, so let's go directly to Italy. Last but not least, uh, Francesca and Eva, which one of you will? Yes, it's, uh, I will be starting. Um, I'll talk about the uh, situation, general uh, working conditions uh, of Italian translators um, of children, children's books. And I start with a few uh, points about uh, the Italian book market. Italy has among the, um, the lowest reading rates in Europe, uh, if not the lowest at all, uh, which makes it um, a, a book market with a very small economic potential. Uh, this is not a good way to start, uh, so to say. Um, but as far as children's books are concerned, fact is that um, this uh, market is heavily uh, dependent on, um, on, on a few strong readers, and many of them are young readers, uh, both kids and young adults. 20% um, of Italian readers are between 
zero and 14 years old. And while this very same age group re represents only 13% of the whole population. And, um, uh, and then on the other side, uh, eight, uh, about 80% of the Italian, of the, of the Italian youth um, are, that, well, they define themselves as readers, which is to say they read at least one, uh, one book per year. Um, while on the whole population, about 40% of Italians do not read one book per year. So this is, this is the market, the, 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 the book in, in market where we um, are working as translators. And um, the, the situation uh, is very um, quite fragmented. Um, there are about 5,000 uh, publishers in Italy and they publish uh, about 80,000 books a year. Um, so this is also to say that uh, we don't have um, um, a national uh, standard contract. Um, we don't have the possibility to um, uh, bargain collectively. Uh, so this makes it for for a very big mess in terms of contracts and uh, and uh, standards and fees. So we we have very very different uh, conditions. We also did uh, with Strade and IT um, this very same um, uh, informal survey about um, among our members who translate uh, kids lit and asked them about um, about conditions, contracts and fees. And uh, the general situation is this, uh, that the contracts are quite similar. They almost never um, have royalties. I mean, royalties is very, very, uh, in very, very few exceptions is considered an option for translators, uh, which means that we very seldom uh, can profit from the success of the work that we've been crafting. And, um, but generally speaking, we also have lower fees for especially um, uh, for um, most common languages, lower fees for uh, translating children's literature. The reason behind may be uh, the fact that uh, as a Cinderella literature, uh, but unfortunately not not in the um, in the positive sense that Enrico Terrignoni uh, spoke about this morning. Uh, so, children's literature is um, being relegated uh, to an ancillary role, which is both unfair and untrue, uh, both in terms of uh, readership uh, that we we want to. Uh, publish, produce quality literature for the young readers who will be the, uh, the future uh, readers, hopefully future grown-up readers uh, tomorrow. And it's also unfair uh, because, um, because of market reasons, because uh, children's literature is among the strongest sectors, economically speaking, in the, in the Italian book industry. Um, Many of my colleagues have mentioned PLR, public lending rights, as uh, a way uh, to, um, it, it, is, um, it is a compensation for authors and also translators uh, for the books that are not being bought <laughs> at the bookshops, but they, because they are, um, they are borrowed from a library. Uh, in Italy, we do have a PLR fund, but it's not um, it, it's not accessible, um, and it, in, it it is not treated in a in a in a, um, a transparent way, because according to Italian law, this money go goes to um, what they call the most representative uh, authors uh, authors group. Uh, and so there, there is this federation of authors who get all the money and uh, we don't know what they do with it. So this is, uh, and we have no way to, to access 
on it as a compensation of all the other rights that are that we are ripped up and uh, so no royalties no plr money lower fees and we don't even have a translation fund in italy not yet <laughs> at least so um there's not really possible to have access to scholarships or um, or other uh, kind of uh, kinds of support. Uh, so it is it is really difficult to make a living out of literary translation, especially if you translate only children's literature. And um, uh, as far as prizes are concerned, there is no uh, specific translation prize um, in uh, in Italy, uh, but we have. A, a bit of everything, both bad practices and good practices. There are um, children's literature prizes that forget <laughs> apparently to even name the translator. Uh, I can mention the, the Orbi Prize. They don't usually name the translator. It's the, it's the, the prize of independ independent books, bookstores um, of children's literature. Uh, or the Cento Prize, which is one of um, quite prestigious Italian awards, who started naming the translator uh, last <laughs> a couple of weeks ago after some translators complaining on social media. But um, even if they name the translator, it's like um, they do it as you know, I'm doing my homework, so here's your name. But there's no real uh, acknowledgement of the translator as the author of the translation and as a uh, as playing a, an important a crucial part in the success of the translated work work but uh, then um, we also have a very um, good example of best practices which is the strega prize for boys and girls that is not um, is not a, spe a specific translation prize but it could be uh, even better, as as uh, Daniel mentioned before me, uh, because it's a mainstream prize. It's a prize for the best book for um, for kids um, uh, and and young people. And uh, if they award a translated prize, an equal amount of money goes to both author and translator. And whenever they uh, only award Italian books, they will use the money to award a single, a single translator among the shortlisted works, which is a very interesting example. Um, this prize um, was established recently, uh, five years ago, and it's also in cooperation with the Bologna, Bologna Book Prize. Um, and Bologna, uh, to close my my uh, speech with a few um, signs of hope and positive remarks um, that things are very slowly going in the in the right direction um, the most important uh, magazine uh, are focusing on children's literature which is um, in Italy that is called Anderson uh, these are started focusing on uh, literary translation for uh, for children and, and, and young people and um, so not the, it's a monthly magazine not in every issue but uh, very often they have they are hosting articles and interviews with translators and or about translation which is uh, which is a way to um, to let our craft be known by people working with uh, promoting books for, for the young readers, teachers, librarians, booksellers, and so on and so forth. And then um, IBBY, um, the Italian section, has uh, also started to, to, uh, to talk with Strade. And we, we had very, very good uh, conversation and uh, public meetings uh, recently during these uh, pandemic times. And um, that, that is also a way to uh, get to know each other and uh, work together for promoting good books and quality books. And uh, we hope that these small steps will uh, bring us a long way.
And then thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Bologna Book Fair that hosts uh, such a meeting like this and many other does many other things to uh, to promote our uh, our work and our job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Francesca, you have. I uh, will ask you to use like five minutes so that we have just five six minutes left for. The Q and A session because it was it has been a very intense uh, overview and morning and so Francesca Novaira from IET. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Simona, and thank you. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Simone, and thank you to the Bologna Children Book Fair for this important event. And uh, thank you to all the great colleagues that have uh, spoken this morning. Uh, we're really thrilled that uh, we have gathered all together here. And it seems that, uh, as Qu Quirk, uh, Kevin Quirk said, uh, we have to stand up uh, for, for our work, for, our, uh, for better conditions. And uh, well, to go quickly, um, um, the Seattle um, um, exalog and uh, guidelines for fair contracts I've already mentioned. So I, I uh, by Kevin before. Um, but what I would say is that uh, the fee for the commission work should be as equitable as literature for grown ups. And uh, because translated children's and juvenile literature is just as difficult if not more difficult than translating literature for grown-ups. The fact that readers are kids does not make it simpler. And uh, despite what many people unfortunately still believe, the challenges are the same, but translators of children books also have to consider target age groups uh, to fit words into a certain layout, uh, to accompany pictures, a third dimension as Anthea Bell uh, called them, and comply with the expectations of adults, which can be parents, uh, teachers, and publishers. And uh, a certain fear of using expression that could be could sound difficult or culturally strange. And uh, as a literature for adults, children literature embrace an infinite variety of genre, like uh, from poetry to thriller, to Bildungsroman, to biography, to science fiction, even non-fiction. So uh, the fee and uh, the conditions should be as equitable as uh, literature for grown-ups. And this uh, is said for con as to contracts are concerned, uh, licensing of, of rights, royalties, and, um, and the visibility of, uh, of a translator as well. The translator should be mentioned uh, whatever the original author is named, whatever on the book front cover or on the back cover, on the title page, and also in the marketing material, which is very important. Translators are always delighted to be involved and to talk about the work they have translated. And I think this could be um, very positive also for the success of the book and for the publisher as well. And finally, uh, as to the, let's say, uh, final, um, um, final uh, step of a translation. In the editing and proofreading process, um, the translator should receive the proofs of, uh, of the, the translator in the final layout. And this is especially important when you're working uh, for children with illustrations. And, um, and to have also a constructive dialogue with the editor and the proofreader. So to have a translation which is respectful, well, of course, of the register and of the author style, but also of foreignisms, of uh, uh, realia, of bad words, of inclusive words. Learning new words and new habits sparks the curiosity of children and broaden their mind. This is really important. As E.B. White said in this uh, interview to the Paris Review in 1969, there is a difference between writing for children and writing for adults. Anyone who writes down to children, I quote, is simply wasting his time. You have to write up, not down. Children are demanding. 
that the most attentive, curious, eager, observant, sensitive, quick and generally congenial readers on earth. Some writers for children deliberately avoid using words they think a child doesn't know. This emasculates the prose and I suspect bores the reader. Children are game for anything. They love words that give them a hard time. So translating children literature is not simpler at all. Children are particularly attentive listeners and readers and critics and excellent jugglers of words themselves. So you have to listen to words with the right ear, as Gianni Rodari said, with no superstructures and a lot of imagination and creativity. Translating children's books means rewriting, revoicing words and pictures and conveying the same feelings and emotions, but also word plays, as we know, jokes, rhymes, names. So uh, it's a very, it is very important that uh, the translation of kids uh, of, of, of books for kids and uh, teenagers and uh, uh, YA uh, are, are paid in, the, in an equitable way with, in uh, fair conditions. And I think there should be also more grants for children literary translators. So to be able to publish authors of languages that otherwise would not be published. As uh, Astrid Lindgren said, and I will finish, good literature gives the child a place in the world and kids have a right to read good and well-translated literature. Thank you, thank you, Francesca. And I would very much like to end on this beautiful note and we'll run out of time, run out of time. But just despite the fact that I will just pick two, one or two uh, questions which are basically the same on the same subject, despite the fact that we'll be talking about two hours about the critical conditions of children's uh, literature translators, there are two questions of, I, I, I imagine, um, young translators who want to get, get, get started into the field. They ask, what practical advice should you give to somebody who wants to translate her, his first children books? How should they proceed? Just one question to whoever of you want to. And this, is, this should be another session, getting started in literary translation that, we, that we be, we'll be having, I think, uh, on this team, but for the general, more general public uh, audience um, publishing. So, but if you just, someone wants to say something about how getting started into children's book translation. Perhaps I say something. Um, you um, should um, write to publishing houses and um, tell them how you became a translator, and then offer them to um, to translate a few pages. And if it's a good publishing house, you um, get that paid, and then they know how you work, and uh, hopefully, a contract will follow. And networking. <laughs> Yeah, networking, I would say networking, go to the book fairs, where, wherever they, whenever they will be again in physical existence, that will be a, a right place to, to start your networking. It's not an easy task. It's not from, it's not something that comes easily and, and quickly, but you have to work hard on it. Yeah, need a long breath. I would also stress the importance of uh, connecting with your uh, National uh, Literary Translators Association. Try to uh, go to workshops as often as possible to see whether you have the knack of translating it at all. And then, of course, children's literature. Um, and try not to work as an individual. Try to realize that you should uh, unite with your fellow translators. Yes, also, yeah. networking is essential, as we, I think, we we showed today for, for would, experienced uh, translators as well. Mm -hmm. I would also add, maybe if if uh, you are still a student, um, try to intern in a in a publishing company for for, for children, and also try to. Um, write uh, reports on books. How do you call them? The fiche de lecture, like to read for a publisher and do those little summaries that will help them decide if they want to publish them or not. Um, yeah, so that's also networking and working and networking at the same time. 
Okay, so I think we really run out of time. I would like to thank you all for your interesting uh, presentations and, uh, and insights of each uh, different countries. Let's hope to, to meet again in person uh, next year and keep the conversation going. We will surely uh, keep in the, the spotlight on this, uh, on these issues that is translating children's book. Thank you all. Thank you very much and, and have a nice day. And just keep uh, following, uh, following us because this is the, just the first day of, of the book fair and many, many things are on as uh, Elena Pozzoli said at the beginning of our, of our webinar. So let's stay in touch and uh, do keep networking and see you all in the next future. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.